Do you think that there was no global network before the internet? That the internet appeared all of a sudden? As a revolution and not evolution? Without even a similar market existing before? That there was no wild west web period of the technology? Think again. The history of the remote data transmission started long before the internet entered our homes. During 80s and 90s, one of the most common ways that average people connected online was to use a dial-up BBS, a sort of a command line style web page, and dial-up internet that came up later. A modem on your computer would literally dial up over an analog phone line, and another modem would respond your call, and establish a connection following a special protocol. Because the phone lines were used in an analog mode, like when we use our landline to call a body, the modems had to convert digital data to sound waves in some way, and told in simple manner, the ones and zeros were represented as variations in sound frequencies easily audible by humans. That's why we hear it like this. The data was transmitted as a series of sounds, analog representation of digital data. The difference is that most of us who were lucky to have experienced the dial-up internet and the rise of the internet itself know that to connect to the network you had to dial up a phone number and wait for the connection. After that you could visit any website in the world that you liked. Before the internet, at least before the appearance of the global networks like Fidenet about it later, a person did the same, just instead of connecting to the global network, you connected to one website only. So for each site, let's call it site for now, you wanted to visit, you had to dial a phone number. One site, one phone number to dial up. And most of the time, such websites were hosted by enthusiasts and not companies. Usually only one person could call and use the BBS at a time, also some multi-line BBSs existed. The first modem for microcomputers was invented by Dennis Hayes in 1977. This device, short for modulator demodulator, allowed two computers to connect to each other over the existing telephone network. At the time, modems generally came in two versions, external modems using an acoustic coupler for connection and direct connection modems used with microcomputers and mainframes. Acoustic couplers were entirely manual. The user picked up the phone's handset, dialed manually and then pressed the handset into the coupler if a career frequency was heard. Internal modems had the advantage that they had allowed to control the entire connection cycle dialing the phone to start and hanging up at the end. None of these systems were available for microcomputers, and Hayes' initial concept was to offer similar products into this market. He soon founded DC Hayes Associates, later Hayes Corporation, which was a leader in PC modems for the most of the 80s. This is a Hayes modem. Plug it into ordinary phone lines and you can send financial projections to the PC down the hall. The Hayes modem. It's like sending your PC to college for under $600. Actually, telecomputing, I call it computers talking to each other, it's really simple. All you need is a modem. That stands for modulator demodulator. That's why I prefer this one. It's a smart modem from Hayes. Look how easy it is to connect. This is the power cord. Plug this cord into any RS-232 computer, then plug the other into the telephone system. So simple. If you run into a problem, just press one key for help. The screen explains what you need to do. I know, you've seen ads with contraptions hooked up to the telephone receiver. Those are acoustic coupler modems. Bad news. They pick up background noise that can block your computer signals. This is much better. In fact, Hayes makes the best modems for microcomputers. A bulletin board system or BBS, also called Computer Bulletin Board System CBBS, is a computer server running software that allows users to connect to the system using a terminal program. Once logged in, the user can perform functions such as uploading and downloading software and data, reading news and bulletins, and exchanging messages with other users through public message boards and sometimes via direct chatting. 
In the early 80s, message networks such as FireNet sprang up to provide services such as NetMail, which is similar to email. They also contain ASCII graphics and animations. Many BBSs also offer online games, in which users can compete with each other. BBSs with multiple phone lines often provide chat rooms, allowing users to interact with each other. It was the intimacy of direct computer-to-computer -computer connection that did it. To call a BBS was like to visit the private residence of a fellow computer fan electronically. BBS hosts had converted a PC, often their only PC, into a digital playground for strangers' amusement. Maybe it was because the system operators or sysops that ran each BBS were always watching. Everything users did scrolled by on their screen, and they soaked in the joy of someone else using their computer. It was a gentle, pleasant form of surveillance. The sysops might initiate one-on-one -on -one chat at any time. Long before texting and slacking and Facebook messaging became the norm for interchange, BBS chats felt like being with someone in person. The first public dial-up BBS was developed by Ward Christensen and Randy Seuss. The two unleashed the kernel of what would eventually spawn the World Wide Web. According to an early interview, when Chicago was snowed under during the Great Blizzard of 1978, the two began preliminary work on the computerized bulletin board system OCBBS. Its inventors wanted a way to keep up with their computer club without having to gather together in person, so they figured out a way to do it with computers. The system came into existence largely through a fortuitous combination of Christensen having a spare S100 bus computer and an early highest internal modem, and Seuss's insistence that the machine be placed at his house in Chicago, where it would be a local phone call to millions of users. CBBS officially went online on 16th of February of 1978. The two developers announced their creation to the world in the November 1978 issue of Byte magazine. The article created a stir among hobbies and hackers. It wasn't long before others began building clones of CBBS. By the mid-80s, BBS supported an active community with no less than three magazines devoted to covering the latest in the proto-online world. The resulting software, called CBBS, allowed personal computer owners with modems to dial in to a dedicated system and leave messages that others would see later, when they in turn dialed up the BBS. People could in theory call BBSs anywhere, but since they'd have to pay for long-distance calls, they tended to stay local. Because of the complexity, limitations and slowness of BBS, the early systems were largely populated by computer enthusiasts willing to shell out big bucks for the fastest modems. CBBS, which kept a count of callers, reportedly connected 353,000 callers before it was finally retired. Unlike today's web, BBS used traditional phone lines to log into remote computers, meaning that if you wanted to dial into a BBS out of your area, you'd be looking at long-distance charges from the phone company. Consequently, even early, BBSs were very locally oriented systems, but before too long the limitations gave birth to phone freaking and other hacks. The first BBSs used homebrew software, quite often written or customized by the sysops themselves, running on early S100 bus microcomputer systems such as IMSAI8080 and Chrome Mcall under the CP-M operating system, Altair 8800, Commodore 128, Apple II, Atari 800, Commodore 64, Amiga 500, and Radio Shark TIS-80. A few years later, in 1981, IBM introduced the first DOS-based IBM PC, and due to the overwhelming popularity of PCs and their clones, DOS soon became the operating system on which the majority of BBS programs were run. 
RBBS PC ported over from the CP slash M world and Fide BBS were the first notable DOS BBS programs. Many successful commercial BBS programs were developed for DOS, such as PC Board BBS and Remote Access BBS. Some popular freeware BBS programs for DOS included Teleguard BBS and Renegade BBS which both had early origins from leaked WWIV BBS source code. BBSs on other systems remained popular, especially home computers, largely because they carried to the audience of users running those machines. The ubiquitous Commodore 64, introduced in 1982, was a common platform in the 80s. Popular commercial BBS programs were Blueboard, Ivory BBS, Color 64. In the early 90s, a small number of BBSs were also running on the Commodore Amiga. Popular BBS software for the Amiga were ABBS, Ami Express, CNET, Stormforce BBS, Infinity, and Tempest. There was also a small fraction of devoted Atari BBSs that used the Atari 800 then 800 XL and eventually the 1040 ST. The early machines generally lacked hard drive capabilities, which limited them primarily to messaging. Speed improved with the introduction of 1200 bits per second modems in the early 80s, giving way to 24 bits per second fairly rapidly. The improved performance led to a substantial increase in BBS popularity. Most of the information was displayed using ordinary ASCII text or SNSI art, but a number of systems attempted character-based graphical user interfaces, which began to be practical at 2400 bits per second. There was a lengthy delay before 9600 bits per second models began to appear on the market. 9600 bits per second was not even established as a strong standard before V32 bits at 14.4 kilobits per second took over in the early 90s. This period also saw the rapid rise in capacity and a dramatic drop in the price of hard drives. By the late 80s, many BBS systems had significant file libraries, and this gave rise to leeching, users calling BBS solely for their files. These users would tie up the modem for some time, leaving less time for other users who got busy signals. The resulting upheaval eliminated many of the pioneering message-centric systems. The systems charged for access typically a flat monthly fee, compared to the per-hour fees charged by Event Horizon BBS and most online services. A host of third-party services sprang up to support these systems, offering simple credit card merchant account gateways for the payment of monthly fees, and entire file libraries and compact disks that made initial setup very easy. Early 90s editions of Broadwatch were filled with ads for single-click install solutions dedicated to this new C source. While this gave the market a bad reputation, it also led to its greatest success. Through the late 80s and early 90s, there was considerable experimentation with ways to improve the BBS experience from its command line interface routes. A number of systems also made forays into GUI-based interfaces, either using character graphics sent from the host or using custom GUI-based terminal systems. The latter initially appeared unsurprisingly on the Macintosh platform where Telefinder and First Class became very popular. First Class offered a host of features that would be difficult or impossible under a terminal-based solution. Skypix featured on Amiga a complete markup language. It used a standardized set of icons to indicate mouse-driven commands available online and to recognize different file types present on BBS storage media. It was capable to transmit data like images, audio files, and audio clips between users linked to the same BBS or offline if BBS was in the circuit of FireNet organization. On the PC, efforts were more oriented to extensions of the original terminal concept, 
with the GUI being described in the information on the host. One example was the remote imaging protocol, essentially a picture description system which remained relatively obscure. MS-DOS continued to be the most popular operating system for BBS use up until the mid-90s. And in the early years, most multi-node BBSs were running under a DOS-based multitasker such as TeskuView or consisted of multiple computers connected via a LAN. In the late 80s, a handful of BBS developers implemented multitasking communications routines inside their software, allowing multiple phone lines and users to connect to the same BBS computer. This included Galacticom's major BBS, later World Group. It solved the breadboard system of TBBS and Falcon. By 1995, many of the DOS-based BBSs had begun switching to modern multitasking operating systems such as OS2, Windows 95 and Linux. One of the first graphics-based BBS applications was Excalibur BBS, with a low bandwidth applications that required its own client for efficiency. This led to one of the earliest implementations of electronic commerce in 1996 with replication of partner stores around the globe. Recent BBS software such as Synchronet or Wildcat BBS provide access using the Telnet protocol rather than dial-up, which allows to connect to a BBS over the internet using a domain name or IP address instead of dial-up a phone number or by using legacy DOS-based BBS software such as Fossil to Telnet Redirector such as NetFoss. Towards the early 90s, the BBS industry became so popular that it spawned three monthly magazines – Boardwatch, BBS Magazine and in Asia and Australia, Chips and Beats Magazine, which devoted extensive coverage of the BBS software and technology innovations and people behind them, and listings to US and worldwide BBSs. In addition, in the US, a major monthly magazine, Computer Shopper, carried a list of BBSs along with a brief abstract of each of their offerings. The demand for complex NSI and ASCII screens and larger file transfers taxed available channel capacity, which in turn propelled demand for faster modems. Initially before the Internet, as it was already said before, a person had to call a BBS using the modem and phone line in order to view its contents. And if you wanted to call a BBS in other cities and countries, you had to pay for long-distance calls, especially if a BBS was located abroad. The Finanet network was created to synchronize messages between BBSs around the world. Finanet was like the Internet. Even if you had to call a BBS of preference using the phone line and you connected to that BBS only, as before, the public and private messages could now be copied between BBSs around the world. So if you posted something on a public message board, there was a good chance someone from another city or even abroad could respond to your message. The same was for private messages, the first email system. In this case you could reach anyone on the FireNet knowing the user's FireNet address. The network was created by an American software developer Tom Jennings to synchronize messages between his and his friends John Merrill's BBSs. In early 1984, Ben Baker was planning on starting a BBS for the newly forming Computer Club at the McDonnell Douglas Automotive Division in St. Louis. Solving some problems in communication between the modem and the computer given to them by the club's president, he learned about the FIRE software. Ben and Tom began collaborating to make the software run properly on the rainbow computer of the club. This caused considerable long-distance charges as they all called each other during development or called into each other's BBSs to leave email. 
During one such call, Baker and Jennings discuss how great it would be if the BBS systems could call each other automatically, exchanging mail and files between them. This would allow them to compose mail on their local machines and then deliver it quickly, as opposed to calling in and typing the message in while on a long-distance telephone connection. Jennings responded by calling into Baker's system that night and uploading a new version of software. It would later be called Fidenet. The mail exchange was usually initiated at night, usually at around 4 am, as the phone calls costed less. When the main fighter software would exit and the separate program Fidenet would run calling other BBSs that had new mail for them, by dialing up the phone number of a BBS from the note list file containing all known BBSs. This would later be known as National Mail Lover and later still as Tom Mail Lover. From then on, joining FireNet required one to set up their system and use it to deliver a net mail message to a special system Node 51. Is that a coincidence? The message contained various required contact information. If this message was transmitted successfully, it ensured that at least some of the system was working properly. The node list team would then reply with another net mail message back to the system in question containing the signed node number. If delivery succeeded, the system was considered to be working properly and it was added to the node list. Initially, each node connected to another one directly. With the node's number constantly growing, the phone charges and their quantity has incremented consequently. As a result, it was decided to change the network structure from the liner to the segmented one, grouping the users by the geographical segments. A complete network address would now consist of the network and node number pair, which would be written with a slash between them. All mail traveling between networks would first be sent to their local network host, someone who volunteered to pay for any long-distance charges. That single site would collect all of the net mail from all of the systems in their network and then repackage it into single packets destined to each network. After all the packets were generated, one for each node, the FireNet program would look up the destination node's phone number in node list BBS and call the remote system. Provided that FireNet was running on that system, the two systems would handshake and if this succeeded, the calling system would upload its packet, download a return packet if there was one and disconnect. That site would then process the mail as normal, although all the messages in the packet would be guaranteed to be local calls. In February 1986, Jeff Rush, one of the group members, introduced a new mailer that extracted messages from public forums that the SIPS ops selected, like the way the original mailer handled private messages. The new program was known as a Tosser Scanner. The Tosser produced a file that was similar or identical to the output of the normal netmail scan. However, these files were then compressed and attached to a normal netmail message as an attachment. The message was then sent to a special address on the remote system. After receiving that mail as normal, the scanner on the remote system looked for these messages and packed them and put them into the same public forum of the original system. In the end of 1986, a similar problem arose at the continent level. Furthermore, the opportunity to receive email using the FireNet protocols and infrastructure was discussed. During the FireNet Technical Standards Committee reunion in October 1986, a new four levels nodes list hierarchy was introduced, adding zones and points. Zones represented major geographical areas, roughly corresponding to continents. There were six zones in total – North America, South America, Europe, Oceania, Asia and Africa. FireNet addresses explicitly consist of a zone number, a network number or region number and a node number. They are written in the form zone network slash node. Points were introduced to receive compressed echo mail and read it locally on the machine. 
points represented non-public nodes, which were created privately on a BBS system. Points were widely used only for a short time. The introduction of offline reader systems filled this role with systems that were much easier to use. In a theoretical situation, a node would normally forward messages to a hub. The hub, acting as a distribution point for mail, might then send the message to the net coordinator. From there it could be sent through a regional coordinator or to some other system specifically set up for the function. Mail to other zones might be sent through a zone gate. From there it was distributed downstream to the destination node. In 1984, FinderNet contained 100 nodes. The growth continued through the 80s, but after 1988, the network took off thanks to faster and less expensive modems and rapidly declining costs of hard drives and computer systems in general. By April 1993, the FireNet listed about 20,000 nodes with about 4 million users. At its peak in 1996, FireNet listed approximately 39,000 systems. The rapidly increasing user base led to difficulties paying long-distance calls and the network maintenance. There was a donation system, users could donate to the sysops of the nodes responsible for international calls and other nodes of choice, but it was not enough, and even that was difficult to legalize as they were not companies with registered businesses. These increasing speeds had the side effect of dramatically reducing the noticeable effects of channel efficiency. All that, plus the rise of the internet in the 90s, led to rapidly decreasing nodes numbers. When modems were slow, considerable effort was put into developing the most efficient protocols and display systems possible. Running a general-purpose protocol like TCP IP over 1200 bits per second modem was a painful experience. With 56 kilobits per second modems, however, the overhead was so greatly reduced as to be unnoticeable. Dial-up internet service became widely available in 1994 and a must-have option for any general-use operating system by 1995. The introduction of inexpensive dial-up internet servers and the Mosaic web browser offered ease of use and global access that BBS and online systems did not provide, and led to a rapid crash in the market starting in 1994. Technically, internet service offers an enormous advantage over BBS systems, as a single connection to the user's internet service provider allow them to contact services around the world. There is a retro moving that is leading to an increase in using the BBSs and fighting it. Today, BBSing survives largely as a nostalgic hobby in most parts of the world, but it's still an extremely popular form of communication for Taiwanese youth, for example. In some countries, people use fighting it as a way to overcome the censorship, where phone lines are not controlled in real time like the internet is. And nowadays there is only a very small fraction of FireNet connections compared to the Internet, so it became a sort of an island in the ocean of the Internet's overwhelming flow of information. There are lists of BBSs available on dedicated websites on the Internet. You can pick up one you like and connect to it using Telnet and your Internet connection without the need to dial up a phone number but just using a domain name, much like opening a normal website. And what do you think about the BBS and FireNet? Let me know in the comments if you had the chance to experience it by yourself. Did you like that experience and do you have nostalgic memories about it? Or do you completely prefer internet and not looking back at all? And if you have never experienced it, do you think it had any sense beyond technological development? And have you ever tried the modern BBS by connecting with Telnet? Or maybe you discovered BBSs and FireNet for the first time? Let me know down in the comments and see you in the next videos.